As we continue our series on the focus of our faith, I'd like to bring a challenging message to you this morning on the importance of seeking after the things of God. What is involved in that? This is the second uh, sermon in this series called Focus of Our Faith. Would you raise your hand if you have not received the, the handout for the notes so our ushers could help you with that? All right, just raise your hand. A couple people right here. Thank you. Just pass those down. They're printed off for you. I don't want to have a whole lot of extras. Give those out. Please take one or more if you want. All right. So as we think about the importance of the focus of our faith, the Apostle Paul here in Colossians chapter 3, is where I'd like you to turn this morning, talks about how we need to set our hearts on things above. What does that mean? How do we do that? I've entitled this sermon, Heavenly Minded Christians. Now, maybe you've heard this phrase before that some people are so heavenly minded that they're no earthly good. How many have ever heard that before? That is such a terrible statement. Now, I know that people, what they mean by that, and, I, and I'm not a real big fan of, uh, you know, Christian colloquialisms and all these little statements that kind of, you know, people try to use that you can slap on a bumper sticker or put on your Facebook wall. You know, people mean that, you know, if you're so heavenly minded, you're only thinking about heaven that you're not thinking about what God has called you to do. I get that. But listen, if your focus is truly on the Christ who sits on the throne of God, you will be moved to take action. It's an attitude of the heart that results in our good works. It results in the way that we live our lives. And so there is a battle of your mind. There's a battle going on even right now, whether you're going to listen to this sermon right now or check your emails or play a game on your phone. It really is. There's a battle of your mind right now to be focused on what is taking place right now and the challenge to think about what it means to have a heavenly mind versus perhaps the things that you're going to be doing later. You're like, Pastor Small, you keep mentioning these things. I'm going to think about it. That's not my intention, of course. But our minds and our hearts and our souls and our spirits, all these things are, are mentioned quite a few times in the Bible for, for a good reason. God has called us to live in an understanding that we are not our own. That we are to offer our lives completely, body, soul, and spirit to the Lord. That's what it says in Romans 12 too. It says, and be not conformed. This word conformed carries with the idea of being molded to its image, but it also carries with the idea of coming to an agreement. Don't let the world mold you. Don't let the world uh, come to an agreement with the world. And so sometimes this word world confuses people. And if you don't know what this word means, it's, it's understood uh, it's the Greek word cosmos, but it's used 20 different times in the New Testament, different ways, the same word. Sometimes it means the terra firma. It means our earth. It means what we're living on, the planet that we are dwelling upon. Sometimes it has the idea of the people that inhabit the world. But here, it carries with it the idea of Satan's evil and wicked system that is in place that is antithetical to everything that God has revealed to us in his word. So we see the world. John says, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. Is it wrong to have a car? Wrong to have a cell phone? Wrong to have things? No, it's saying don't love those. And really the word is lust in the sense of don't, don't let your passions and your affections be so, so geared towards that that that's what you're living for. But notice what Paul writes in Romans 12 too. We know this verse, and we, it's quoted a lot, and rightfully so, because it's a powerful verse. But he says, don't be conformed to this world system, but be transformed. That's an inside job. That's something that takes place from within. But look how we're supposed to be transformed, church. It says, by the renewing of your mind. Your heart is your spiritual mind. You see that word? We see the word mind. It's what we're thinking about. It's what we're dwelling upon. That we may prove, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. What is the will of God? That which is pleasing to God in all things. That's what that means. So having a heavenly mindset is very important for fulfilling the will of our Father. And we understand that. This is what God has called us to do. So we must actively seek and pursue the Lord Jesus Christ, the King of kings, and his kingdom. What did Jesus say in Matthew 6.33? Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. It's for this reason that Satan is always attacking the minds of believers with doubts, worries, fears, but also worldly thoughts to get us 
thinking about the things of the world more so than the things of God. And so they are, yes, opposite, but we recognize that our jobs and our families and our relationships and what we do, the hobbies that we enjoy, the shows that we watch on TV, the music that we listen to, all these different things are not disconnected from one another, but rather are all connected. And the Bible has a lot to say about how that is. Our lives. But Satan, our enemy, wants to keep believers from focusing on what really matters. That's why when the Bible tells us, especially the verse that we just read a moment ago from Romans chapter 12, that we need to be transformed, there's this mindset of, of it's continual. It's not just one time. There's this ongoing process of discipleship, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. But we need to, to, to discipline our hearts and our minds into thinking that way. Is your Bible open to Colossians chapter 3? Paul's letter to the church at Colossae is powerful. It's important. It's important. And the importance that he places upon steadfastness in the word, the understanding of, of the spiritual battle that we're in. Some people call Colossians the twin sister epistle to the book of Ephesians. Paul's letter to the church at Ephesus. Very, very interesting and challenging things that we find in this letter. Beginning in verse 1 of Colossians chapter 3, Paul writes, If ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ, or with Christ in God. Verse 4, When Christ, who is our life, shall appear. Aren't you looking forward to that day, church? Then shall ye also appear with him in glory. Mortify therefore your members which are upon the earth, fornication, uncleanness, inordinate affection, evil concupiscence, and covetousness, which is idolatry. For which things sake the wrath of God cometh on the children of disobedience. This morning we're going to look primarily at the first four verses of this particular chapter as Paul's writing to the church at Colossae as we think about what God has called us to do. The person who has placed their face, faith in Almighty God, has thoughts that are consumed with God and his kingdom. And they will have perfect peace instead of anxiety and worry. They will have an understanding of what God has called them to do rather than living a life of darkness and confusion. Listen to what it says in Isaiah 26. I love this verse. Before we actually get right into the meat and bones of our, uh, of our sermon uh, outline, Isaiah 26, verses 3 and 4 read, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Trust ye in the Lord. That is the proper name of God, Jehovah, forever. For in the Lord Jehovah, Isaiah says, is everlasting strength. Listen again. Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee. Our mind is focused upon God. So it's not that when we're thinking about heavenly things or thinking about God that we become disconnected from our everyday life. Far from it. But we have the proper focus. We understand what it is that God has called us to do. So this morning we're going to be looking at four aspects of how we can develop and maintain a heavenly mindset. Do you have a heavenly mindset? Are you seeking to let God lead and control your life and your mind. All right, let's talk about that this morning. Number one, the focus is upon our resurrected position. We must focus upon our resurrected position. Look what uh, Paul says at the very first phrase of what we call chapter three. That's not obviously how Paul wrote it. It was just one long letter, but we've divided it up for the ease of reading. But we go to chapter three, we look at verse one. Notice what he, what he says there. He says, if ye then be risen with Christ. Church, this is not a question of wondering whether this is kind of like, oh, if you're a Christian, he's saying because you are risen with Christ. That is your standing with the Lord. Let's think about this. When Christ died, we died with him. The Bible clearly tells us. We'll look at some verses later on in Romans. But when he was resurrected, we were made alive in him. I'm excited about the fact that we're going to do baptism shortly. And we have a number of young people who have come to me or I've met with their parents and have professed to know Jesus Christ as their Savior. What is the next step for these young people? Baptism. Are you with me this morning, church? Are you with me? 
So we think about that. And so I was showing in our, my Bible class, I do the fifth and sixth graders, and, uh, and, uh, and, I was, and one of the little boys who doesn't go to our church, his, his father's a pastor of a church not too far from here, and he got, was all excited. He wanted to tell everybody he got baptized. So I said, Evan, come on up here, bud. I said, we're going to pretend you're getting baptized. He goes, without water? I said, we're just going to, we're just going to do it. Just follow. I said, I do a lot of the baptisms, and, and I said, I've, I've done it many, many times, and I said, I promise I won't drown you, so here we go. Now, there's about 17 kids, eyeballs on Evan. He comes up, and I said, Evan, do you know Jesus Christ is your Savior? Yes, sir. If you were to die today or sometime in the future, where would you go? Heaven. So your desire to live for the honor and glory of the Lord Jesus Christ? Yes, sir. I said, upon your public profession in Jesus Christ, I baptize thee, my little brother, in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death. And then what else do I say? Raised in the likeness of his resurrection and the newness of life. Because that is our resurrected position. And that's what baptism signifies. You're not getting your sins cleansed. You know that. There's nothing, there's nothing a, it's not a spiritual transaction other than, it's a, it's a, other than obedience. And so as we understand that, this is what Paul is saying, because you are risen with Christ. If ye then be risen with Christ. Since you are, as a result of, we are made alive in him. This is the reality of our identity in Christ Jesus. I like what Paul says in Ephesians. I'll put it up on the screen. Ephesians 2, verses 4 through 6. Look what he says. But God, who is rich in mercy. Now, this is, of course, written to believers who had come out from the world, who are gloriously and wonderfully saved by God's grace through faith. It says, for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins. Christ loved us. God loved us while we were unworthy. He quickened us up. That word quicken means to make alive together with Christ. For by grace are ye saved. And he says it again in verse 8. But notice what he says in the, in the last part of that. In verse 6. He hath raised us up together and made us what? Sit together where? In heavenly places. We're still here on this earth. We're still struggling through this carnal, wicked body that needs to be changed into the image of the Lord Jesus Christ on a daily basis. We're still going through sickness and, and disease and struggles and all these other evil passions that we have to, 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 to deal with on a regular basis. How is that our reality? It is your position of righteousness in Christ. That's how God sees you. Woe is me, I'm just a sinner, no good, nothing. You're talking about your past, not your now. You are indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God. This is what Paul was saying. So then he says in verse 1, if ye then be risen with Christ. Why does he say that? Why didn't he just say, if you're saved, if you're happy and you know it, raise your hand. Why didn't he just say something like that? He said, if you're risen with Christ. And notice what he said here. He's raised us up together and made us sit together. That will one day become the reality of our physical bodies receiving a glorified body but that is who you are in Christ, because in Christ you have everything. Peter said, we have all things that pertain to life and godliness in Christ Jesus. Isn't that exciting, church? So we focus on our resurrected position. But secondly, we walk in continual discipleship. Now here's the, really the focus of, of this message. I'm probably going to park on this one for a little bit. Notice what it says here. He says, seek those things which are above. Our theme this year for 2020 is focusing upon whom? Ourselves? Our neighbors? Other people? No, our focus is upon the Lord so that we can see clearly and do what God has called us to do. Focusing upon the Lord. So he says, seek those things which are above. You've got to have your eyes open, seek. You've got to have, be ready and have a discerning spirit to pursue what God wants us to, to pursue. The word seek is pursue. It's to follow after. There's a psalm that says, in fact, we sang the song this morning, as the deer intentionally, as the deer panteth for the water, so my soul longeth after thee. He's seeking. That's the word. This, in, this is intentional. We're not just kind of haphazardly kind of going through life hoping that we find God. We know exactly what God wants us to do because we're pursuing after him. And he's not running away from us. He's running to us because he loves us. So here he's is admonishing the church at Colossae to seek those things which where? where? That are what? Above. Oftentimes the Bible refers to things above or up 
as a reference to where God is, but Paul makes it very clear, the, second, the next phrase, he says, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. There's no confusion about where he's talking about, seeking heavenly things. So, so we walk in continual discipleship, directing our hearts, pursuing God toward the eternal. It does not happen by accident. It only happens through righteous discipline. This is what we need to do in response to the fact that God gives us his strength and his grace to do so. He's called us to do this. So this challenge that the Apostle Paul is giving is for us to pursue what God wants us to pursue with all of our hearts, nothing held back. If you're not actively seeking things above, then you will not be thinking in a heavenly manner. You just won't. And you let the things of this world become the most important things in life. Things that can be detrimental to your spiritual health. Things that will impact your children and your grandchildren, your friends, your church family, everybody around you. And you really won't have a desire to do anything that God has called you to do. I want you to think about this. In Matthew chapter 6, verse 24, Jesus was teaching what we call the Sermon on the Mount. He's giving a number of different things that are very powerful. But he says, no man can serve two masters. That's no one. That's man, woman, boy, or girl. That's no one is able to do this. You cannot serve two masters. Many people have tried and failed miserably. They said, I can have one per foot in the church and one foot in my relationship with God, but I can pursue the things of the world at the same time. You can't. And it's so important that we recognize this. Hopefully our desires are to serve our Lord and Savior. The word Lord means master. Lord, what will thou have me to do? So we're not... We don't, there's no divided allegiance. So Jesus was speaking about the way in which we view our lives. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and do what? Despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon just means the things of this world. The things that we think we have to have. Now again, heavenly-minded Christians are not unaware of the things that we need, and so is God. Later on he says, take no thought of the things that you need. God knows what you need. We don't have to tell God that we need these things. God knows what you need, and he will provide for your needs. Sometimes we just confuse needs and wants. And that sometimes is the problem. But let's think about this. There are three ways in which we can demonstrate, and there's probably a hundred if I really thought about it, but I'm going to give you three this morning that are kind of underneath the second point. If you're taking notes, this is point number two, and this is kind of like A, B, and C. As we think about what do we do to have spiritual discipline in our life, number one, we must saturate ourselves with Scripture. I've had people that tell me that they have a long commute to work. What should they do? And I said, listen, if you can hook up your phone, there's some apps that you can get where you can have the Bible read to you, do that. My dad, for many years, when he commuted all the way uh, to the other side of Merrimack where he worked, he would actually have, he had the Bible on DVD or on CD. I'm not sure if it was Alexander Scorby or James Earl Jones. It was somebody with a really deep voice. I borrowed his car one time, and all of a sudden it came on. I like, couldn't figure out how to turn it off. But... It was good. You know, that's what he was listening to, and he listened to it all the time, read through the Bible that way. It's good for you to just hear it. Sometimes, it's, of course, it's good to read it on your own and process it, but the point is study the Bible. Meditate upon the Word, but we saturate our heart with Scripture. It is through the Scripture that we renew our minds. God has told us that. It's, and we start to think about the things that are noble, good, and righteous. Turn, if you would, to Philippians chapter 4. I'll show you what I mean by that. This is not a vague thinking of, Oh, positive thinking. That's what some people will say. Just, just think on the positive. Don't be a negative person. Just think positively. That's all that matters. Look what it says in Philippians 4, verse 8. Paul is ending this letter to the church that he loved that met in a place called Philippi. He says, finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are holy. By the way, the word just means righteous. Whatsoever things are lovely, of good report. If there be any virtue and if there be any praise, do what? What does it say? Think on these things. So are we defining those words? Church, is that what we're doing? That's not what God has called us to do. There's the context to everything that he just listed here in Philippians 4 8, and that is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is our focus. And the manifestations of the way in which we can live righteously and live holy and live honestly and live lovely and have a good report, which means your reputation, all these things we're pursuing, to be virtuous. It's not some ambiguous uh, morality of whatever you want it to be. It's the reality of your relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ because we have been called to be like Christ. Christ did some things that we could never do, of course. He's our Savior. He died on the cross for us. Some of you know that our son, Micah, 
uh, has special classes that he takes at our local public elementary school here. Hopefully next year he'll be here at Tabernacle. And we've met his teachers, we've met the principal, the very kind people. And so Micah takes these classes to help him with a little bit of some of the uh, uh, difficulties that he has academically. And he, I ask him, I always ask him about how things go outside of class. I get recess or things like that. And, and Micah had said, well, Dad, I try to tell people about God, but there's some people that don't believe in God. And he has this look on his face like he is startled by this. And I appreciate his sensitivity. And I said, well, what did you say, Micah? He said, well, they say God's dead. And, and Micah, is, if you don't, Micah is very passionate. He, if you talk to him about scores, he could tell you every basketball score for our Falcons boys basketball team. He, he has that kind of... Uh, you know, a little bit of that autism spectrum, so he can just rattle off these numbers, and he's very passionate about all these things. And one time, I was trying to correct him, and he was right, and, and I was wrong. <laughs> and so he's like, Dad! He goes, Dad, they said God's dead! And I said, there's no way! And, and he said, one kid, his name was Damien, he said, he said, nobody can die and then come back to life. And, they, and he goes, I said, yeah, God could. What an answer from an eight-year-old, huh? I'm so proud of my son. I just want to tell you that story. Uh, but you think about it, saturated in the world, we're not making up our own morality. We're not making up our own belief system. We believe in God. We believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on the cross for our sins. And so Paul is saying, think about those things. Let that saturate your mind because it's through the Word. That's why it's so important that we spend time in the Word, that we study the Word, that we let the Word affect us. We don't just make it an academic pursuit. It's a spiritual pursuit. This is how we start to think more like Christ. I'll give you another one. Well, actually, Psalm 119.97. I forgot I had this verse. Oh, how I love thy law, the psalmist sings. It is my what all the day? My meditation. I'm thinking about it all the time. Not just something I do to get over with, like taking a vitamin, you pop it in, you move on with your day. It is something that you think about all the time. All right, secondly, we reject the things of the world. This is tough. The line of separation for some Christians is in a different spot than others. And we have spiritual liberty in Christ to develop our own uh, areas where we, where we stand and what we'll ch choose to do or not do. And, and you really do. You have that right. There were some that disagreed with Paul on some areas of spiritual liberty, some that thought it was a sin to, to eat meat that had been offered idols. And I'm not necessarily going to go down that road this morning. But there are certain things that we just know are just wrong. And so where do we see this in the Bible? It is, it is not so that we live like we're the Amish and we claim everything is bad, or even beyond that. It's not a matter of just not believing in electricity or driving a car or you know, using the Internet or something. We're talking about this idea that we're rejecting the things of the world in the sense that they are not the things that we're pursuing after, as if that's our only purpose of life. Let me, let me explain what I mean by that. In order to think heavenly thoughts, we must keep away from the things that would draw us away from God. So again, when, we, when I put rejected, there's certain things that we know that can become something that detracts us from the purpose of God. Even things that may not be intrinsically sinful. Be hobbies that consume your time. Things that, that drag us away from being together with the body of believers. I mean, you're thinking tonight, where are you going to be tonight for life group? Hopefully it's at the life group meeting. But why wouldn't it be? Perhaps there's something else that you're already planning on doing instead of that. You know, sometimes these are things that we do, things that occupy our time, things that, we're, that affect our thoughts and affect our actions. You know, if you want your life to be marked by righteous actions, you must think righteous thoughts. There's no doubt. And that's exactly what God is teaching us here in his word. But sometimes this may not always be that easy. Let's go back to Colossians chapter 3. Notice what we're talking about here. In verse 5 in particular, Paul uses language that is very intense. He says mortify. The word mortify means to put to death. And we're going to see this in a little bit when we look at Romans. But notice what he says here. He says mortify therefore your members. So we're talking about our eyes, our mouth, our hands, our feet. What we do. Members. We're talking about our physical body. We put to death those things that are upon the earth. Okay? The things that we can pursue. The things that we can go after. We get it, right? whole bunch of stuff. But he says, but he lists some in particular. He's talking about the purity that begins in our heart that 
if, if we're not seeking to be pure, can affect the way that we live, even as believers. Fornication, all, that's, the, that's the large umbrella of all type of sexual perversions. Uncleanness, inordinate what? What's the next word? Inordinate affection. And that word has everything to do with your heart. When your heart is not right, when your affections or your desires are not right, you're not thinking right, you will eventually act sinfully. You see the battle of the mind here. It's very obvious. Look, look what it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Paul was talking about a spiritual battle here. And he's talking about the God of this world who blinds the hearts of those who would believe. And then verse 5, he's talking to believers. He says, we must cast down imaginations. The word imag imaginations is your thought life. It's what you're thinking about. So we've got to cast it down. And every high thing that exalteth itself against what? The knowledge of God. Things that are antithetical to God and his word. And then it says, and we bring into captivity. We capture those thoughts to the obedience of Christ. Because you are constantly going to be at war with your mind. We must bring it into captivity. And this is continual. Remember, this is under the heading of continual discipleship. Not, I did that 72 years ago. Or whenever it was. Um, we're talking about understanding our reality now. All right, number three, we develop healthy friendships. This is so vital. And this is one of the things I've had quite a few people tell me, Pastor, I love the idea that we're doing life groups. And, and I'm like, hey, this, this is, is something that's different. Some churches don't do it because they somehow think it's not good to ha not have a typical church service. It doesn't bother me at all. I like that we're gathering together. We don't do it for more than a month, but I, but I, so I, I do like that we do have a service, but I do think it's, it's neat when we're able to meet at people's homes. It's a little bit more informal in that setting, but it's also the goal of this is to grow. Um, I almost changed them from life group to focus groups, but then I thought that sounded weird. The point of the life groups is that we grow together, that we're looking the same way, that there's, you're not just sitting there and kind of trying to be a, 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 you know, a, a, a fly on the wall, but you're, you're there and you're participating and you're part of what's going on there and you're, and you're growing. But set aside the life groups, all relationships that we have hopefully are ones that help you grow spiritually. Obviously, we have people that we know that may not be believers yet, and our influence on them may be just because we've known them for a long time, we work with them or whatever. But the point is your, your closest and deepest friendships ought to be people who are helping you in your walk with God. Let's think about this. We must develop friendships with wise, godly believers who will help us seek spiritual things because our thinking is often influenced by our friends. You might not necessarily totally agree with that. You might say, well, I think it's, I'm not... I'm not saying it's totally influenced by your friends, but it is influenced by your friends. What do people do nowadays before they go out to eat? Maybe the younger generation does this more so than some of you, but whatever category you think you're in, you kind of look and say, you want to read the reviews. Is this good or not? You buy something on Amazon, you read all the reviews. At least I do that. And maybe you do as well. We want to know what other people think. And, and so, so oftentimes we're influenced that way. We're gathered together. What do so-and-so, what do they think about this or that? Sometimes it's interesting. We might even be talking about politics, or we could be talking about investing your money, or we could be talking about other things outside of what we typically think of spiritual things. But when we have godly people helping us and influence us, that will impact us. So we go back to Colossians chapter 3, verse 1. It says, or verse 2, or no, verse 1. Seek those things which are above where Christ sits on the right hand of God. Set your affection on things where, church? On things above. Are you doing that? I found this to be a rule of, of interpreting the Bible. When God tells us to do certain things, it's being said and told to us because we are capable of doing the opposite. We're being commanded to do something. It'd be like, I'm going to tell everybody in this room to breathe. Please breathe. Okay, everybody breathe. There's no command to breathe. We do that. We stop breathing for a little while. We are going to be in trouble. It's not, there's things in the Bible that we say, well, that doesn't apply to me, or I'm good with that, I'm all set. No, these are challenges to the believer in Christ because we're capable of doing the opposite. That, that's why it says, set your affection on things above, not on things on the earth. Well, that's insulting. I don't like to come to church and be accused of doing this. I'm not accusing you of living this way, but if you're like me, it's very easy to get our focus off of God. Proverbs 13, 20 says, He that walketh with wise men shall be what, church? 
shall be wise, but a companion of fools shall be destroyed. In Hebrews 10, 24, this is the verse that comes before the verse that often is quoted by pastors about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. That's the verse about coming to church. It's a great verse. Verse 24 says, let us consider one another to provoke unto love and to good works. The word provoke is not usually used in a positive way. We usually think about provoking your little brother or sister. And we have that problem a lot at our home, all right? I won't say which ones because some of them might uh, be listening right now. But the, the, the provocation sometimes means a, a stirring up. So why do you need to be around other people who share your faith and know that they love you and you love them? Because we can be provoked to two things. To love, to love God supremely and others sacrificially, and also to do good works. So you hear preaching often about don't just sit in your seat. Get out there and serve the Lord. Don't just be someone who listens to sermons. Go out there and do what you've been challenged to do. We've all been done that. But, but it happens not just because I'm preaching it from a pulpit and I have your undivided attention on a Sunday morning. It's We're supposed to do that with one another. Let us, all of us, let us one another challenge one another, encourage one another. That's the value of healthy friendships. Number three, go back to our main points. We must live in our crucified position. We must live in our crucified position. In order to have a heavenly mindset, we must reckon our death with Christ. We must see ourselves dead with Christ. Where does Paul say that? He says that in verse 3 of Colossians chapter 3. Notice, church, for ye are what? What does it say? For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ in God. How are you dead if you're living and breathing? That is who you are concerning what happened with your sin. That's why sometimes when I hear people talk about their sin and they speak in pre-salvation terms, they say, I'm just a sinner. Well, that's not who you are in Christ. Why did Paul say that? He says, if you then be risen with Christ, that's your identity. He says, for ye are dead. He's saying, how do you have a heavenly mindset? How do you develop it? How do you maintain it? Acknowledge your death with Christ. We must ask this question, to what exactly did we die? To what exactly did we die? Three things that the Bible reveals to us. Number one, we're dead to sin. You might say, that seems difficult. And it almost is a bit, um, you might say, not oxymoronic, but, but it's the, uh, a word that, that implies something that, that, that seems false, but is true. It's the reality of it. Um, we call that a paradox. And watch. In order to have a heavenly mindset, we must reckon our death to sin. We died with Christ. Now, we see this in Romans 6, 11, and 12. Likewise, reckon ye also yourselves to be what indeed unto sin. What does it say? Dead unto sin. Think about that. But alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Why is this challenge, why is this challenge given? Because some people just go, oh shucks, I can't do anything but sin. Really? That's not what this verse is telling us how to live. There's some people that even say that. We just sin all the time and just kind of get used to it. Deal with the reality that your identity in Christ is that you are to be dead to sin. Yes, we're going to sin from time to time. But we have the power through Christ not to live that way. Amen, church? And it's like we, we kind of like tell us, and that's how Satan works. He tries to convince us of something opposite of what the Bible says. The very beginning of this chapter, Paul says, should we continue in sin that grace may abound? Now, what does he say? God forbid. So there are some that teach a perfect sanctification that you can come to a place where you're never going to sin again. That's not what the Bible teaches. But I do believe in a holiness and a separation unto God that's lived out because we are to be dead to sin. Let me give you another one. Dead to self. Dead to self. That involves the fact that we recognize that we are not our own. For some believers, they can't seem to develop a heavenly mindset because they're so consumed with their own selfish desires instead of pursuing after the will of God. There's no victory because the only thing that motivates them and moves them is what pleases them. That's why Paul would often say, I don't do this to please myself or others. I do this to please God. Think about that. Your time and your treasure reveal your heart. Galatians 2.20 is a verse I think every believer should memorize. It's powerful. I am crucified with Christ. That's your spiritual position. You're crucified with Christ. That's what he's saying. I'm crucified with Christ. And then he says, nevertheless, I live. I'm alive. 
but I'm supposed to be dead to sin. I'm supposed to be dead to myself. Then he says, yet not I, but who lives in me? Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, the physical life that I'm living, I live by what? The faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See how we're supposed to live in that reality? That is death to self. That is not what the world says. The world says, you only go around one time, so soak it all in. This is not your best life now, as some would say. There's a life yet to come. But what we do now echoes in eternity. And this is what Paul is saying. You're dead. Notice the end of verse 3. And your life is hid with Christ in God. We're also supposed to be dead to the world. I'm going to show you a verse that is powerful, that is kind of at the end of Galatians. And sometimes it's one of those ones we might just kind of read it quicker than we should. I know I've done that. If we're going to think on heavenly things, church, we must continually acknowledge ourselves dead to the things of this world so we can seek the things above. And this is so hard. This is so hard. So we, we recognize that. Paul said, this is a struggle. He goes, the things I know I should do, those are the things I don't always do. And the things I know I shouldn't do, those are the things I do. So he was acknowledging that struggle is real. Again, we're not saying everything that is worldly is evil. That's what some would teach. And some even teach that today. Everything that is physical is intrinsically evil, and everything that's spiritual is good. That's not what the Bible is teaching at all. There's things that we can enjoy, things that we can, uh, that, that have, that bring us delight on this earth. But they're not necessarily supposed to be our, the things that we worship, the things that we love. But notice this verse right here, Galatians 6.14. It's up on the screen. It says, but God forbid that I should glory. He was talking about glory and in, in his sanctification and glory and how, how spiritual he was. He goes, because it's all about Jesus. He says, save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, look at the next phrase. By whom the world is what? Crucified to me. And then Paul says, and I unto the world. Now, there are some people that disagree on the interpretation here, but I think it's very clear. I think the Apostle Paul is very clear in saying, the world has no influence upon me. Now, what does he mean by that? Is he talking about the physical planet? No. Is he talking about the people on the earth? Well, sort of. He's talking about Satan's system that is antithetical to God's kingdom. We say the world, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. He says, by whom that world, that Satan system is dead to me, and I unto the world. But he went and he risked his own life doing what God had called him to do to preach the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ, because that's what he knew pleased God. And so we look at this and we say, how can I keep my eyes fixed upon the Lord? I live in the reality of my identity in Christ. Let me give you the last one. We'll be done tonight, or this morning. Focus upon our future with Christ. Focus upon our future with Christ. There's a lot of songs in our hymn book that we could sing about the very fact that one day we will see the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice what he says here in verse 4. He says, when Christ, who is our life? Jesus has many titles. I love the fact that he is called the resurrection and the life. He's given you eternal life, but he's called the one who gives life. He is life. He is life. When Christ, who is our life, Paul writes, shall appear. When will that happen? Every generation expected the Lord to return. And Peter even says, hey, there's going to be those that mock. They'll say, hey, when is your Savior coming back? And it's been thousands of years, but here's the thing. Jesus will come back one day. And we may be the, the, the generation that does not know death in the physical way, but will be raptured or caught up and uh, translated uh, just like Enoch and just like Elijah. It's going to be an experience. There's only going to be some of us that would be able to have that experience to say compared to the billions of people that will be in the presence of God in heaven. But he's saying we must focus upon our future with Christ. How so? The believer who truly understands this, that we will appear with him in glory. What verse 4 is talking about? His return, our future glory with him will be consumed with it. Don't be so heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. Please be heavenly minded so you can be the greatest good for the Lord. That you let this that the focus of our faith becomes upon the very fact that Christ is who we're looking forward to. We live for Christ. 
We live in the reality of our identity, and we live in the fact that Jesus Christ is coming again. That's why it says in Philippians 3.20, it's awesome, when you think about what he was writing about. He says, for our conversation, the word conversation means citizenship, who we are, our identity. He says, it's in heaven. And then we say, we're Americans, or we're from New Hampshire, or for some of you that live in Massachusetts, all right, uh, or wherever you live, and you can identify yourself, I'm this or that, I, I'm, you know, and, and then we say, well, ultimately, as a believer, your citizenship is in heaven. Now. That's not just a future tense thing. That's a now thing. And Paul says, because of that, from whence also we look for the Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, because we're just pilgrims and strangers passing through a land that really isn't our own. Hey, listen, there's a lot of believers who struggle with the fact that, that this is what they think it's all about. Even believers in Christ. Again, why would Paul say what he said in verse 4 if it's not something that sometimes in some aspects of our lives we struggle with? Because sometimes we struggle with this. When Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then shall ye also appear with him in glory. As a result of that, live godly. Don't live for this world. Have a heavenly mindset. Seek those things which are above, where Christ sits on the right hand of God. When we think about this, the return of Christ and our future glory should transform our thoughts. It should transform our conversations and should transform our daily pursuits. How has that affected your life? We should be able to point to tangible evidence in our daily lives that say, my thoughts, my conversations, my pursuits are all a reflection that I am not living for this world but I am living for the one who has saved me, who is my Lord, who is my King. Are you a heavenly-minded Christian? Church, I'm challenging you to think really hard about this. The focus of our faith should not be an afterthought. There is spiritual discipline that is necessary. We must live in the reality of our identity in Christ. With